Добрый день, меня зовут Марина Киселева, и у нас в гостях Марк Аткинсон, сооснователь и генеральный директор компании Мершин. My first question is about virtual reality. So it's one of the most important technologies today. So how does it uh, transform, how does it change teaching process and learning process? Well, so um, virtual reality has wide applications for teaching and learning. Um, the most immediate applications that schools are starting to adopt is to create virtual experiences for children. Our work in virtual reality creates effectively a classroom simulator mm -hmm. where teachers can practice in virtual reality teaching avatars of students who manifest learning challenges that they would face in the classroom. So for example, um, we all know that when teachers are teaching reading to young children, you will have a child who is in kindergarten who is already reading at a fourth grade level and you'll have a child who's never held a book um, who doesn't know their letters or their sounds and for a teacher the challenge of differentiating that instruction and making instruction engaging for the advanced reader and the beginning reader is very challenging how do i organize my room what sort of questions do i ask um, what sort of text do I give them? How do I engage everybody at one time? We create virtual environments where teachers can practice these routines as much as they want before they go to try them out in real classrooms on mm -hmm. children. Um, and we've seen incredibly powerful results with doing that kind of work. Well, so for example, we have studied how teachers develop the skill of asking open-ended questions. So mm -hmm. in conversation um, or in any classroom discourse, the job of the teacher is to facilitate a conversation, ideally that children, learners have with one another about subject matter. If you read the research, it does no good for a teacher to ask a student and a short yes no answer question um, it almost isn't even good enough for the teacher to ask a short answer question what you want children doing is discussing debating the the application of content to real world ideas so much of the 21st century is about critical thinking mm -hmm. and problem solving so in a math lesson for example I don't want to prove that you have the fastest answer to the problem. I want to encourage the entire class to try the problem in different ways and then go to the board and explain why multiple paths got the right answer. Mm -hmm. That's critical thinking. Teachers are not used to leading that kind of a classroom environment. Um, lots of things can get in the way. Kids have different aptitude for mathematics. Um, you might have children that have behavioral problems um, or other ch language problems that uh, occur in the classroom. So in our simulator, a teacher gets the chance to practice the act of asking the kind of open-ended questions that would make that math conversation mm -hmm. possible. We've studied putting teachers through simulation and have found that with only four 10-minute sessions uh, around asking open-ended questions, we can get teachers to more effectively and more frequently use open-ended questions in their real classroom mm -hmm. after only sort of four sessions in simulation. And we think that we can begin to break down other skills this way as well so that teachers develop a repertoire of skills that they can use in the classroom. Uh, how you collect data to make these avatars, children avatars, be uh, realistic? So we do that in a variety of ways. Um, first of all, um, the technology has gotten to the point where I can actually take a digital image of a real child 
and render that child as an avatar in almost real time now. Mm -hmm. But that only gives the outward appearance uh, of reality for the child. Then the question becomes, does their tone of voice and their facial expressions reflect the way real children look in a classroom when they are confused or upset or angry or sad for reasons that have to do with something that happened at school or reasons that might have to do with something at home. So for that, we work with researchers and, um, and we are mining the data of real-time interactions that are happening through our system over and over and over again to study how adults and children behave when they are under stress through simulations. So we study the facial muscles mm -hmm. and how faces contort themselves when adults or children are excited or engaged and what do they look like when they're bored or confused by a subject. What do, what do they look like when they're angry or they might have been the subject of bullying earlier in the day. All of those things we are looking to program our avatars to manifest and, and show to the teacher who is learning uh, how they feel so that the teacher can practice how she deals with a student who is struggling with a particular subject matter. Um, we analyze teachers for their tone of voice. We can tell teachers who are demeaning, for example, to children or have low expectations of children. And how do we get at low expectations? Well, if we create a classroom of boys and girls of different race and ethnicity, we can tell how much time the teacher spends with each child. Do they ask the child of a different gender or race the same questions they ask the child of their own gender and race, for example? Um, we can tell whether or not the boys get as much time as the girls, or the girls who tend to be in many classes the better students get all the time to talk, and the boys who have behavioral issues don't get as much time to talk. All of these things are good feedback for teachers who may not be aware that that's happening when they're teaching a group of children. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do you use big data? So we use big data to study the voice analysis, we, to analyze the voice of the learner, to analyze the facials of the learner, and to improve the artificial intelligence of the system so that more and more the avatars driven by AI can behave the way children and adults would in the exact same situation. So after, for example, after thousands of simulations that are done by different teachers around the same math problem, we can start to predict how children will behave um, when they're confronted with that math problem. And we use artificial intelligence to drive the avatars to start to behave that way. So that eventually, our system, which is a blend of artificial intelligence and a real human actor who is somewhere in the world inhabiting those avatars, someday we won't need that human. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, it'll be pure artificial intelligence. Today, today it is a blend of both. Mm -hmm. uh, would you tell us a little bit about uh, corporate training and uh, the use of these techniques in uh, training in the sphere of medicine? Medicine uh, has had a long established practice of doing what they call simulated patient work. Um, the most common simulated patient work is for doctors and nurses around their bedside manner. So for example, a big part of the job of a doctor or a nurse is to explain a medical procedure to a patient mm -hmm. or explain it to the family of a patient so that they can get their support and understanding. And of course, sometimes one of the big challenges that doctors have is to explain when they make a mistake. So mm -hmm. uh, a huge part of medical training is to train doctors who do make mistakes how to interact with patients and families when they do. Mm -hmm. um, and so the way that is done in medical schools today is real actors are hired to pretend to be patients um, and, um, 
and doctors rehearse those conversations w with, those do with those actors. Um, that's very expensive. And it's limiting because let's say the patient is a young child or a very, very old person. It's hard to find an actor that can be the young child, the middle-aged man, and the very old person all at one time. Mm -hmm. We can have an avatar that's all of those and, and of any race and ethnicity. And sitting behind our technology might be a young woman who's role-playing those characters. But our software turns the young woman into the little child, the middle-aged man, or the old person. So it creates a great deal of flexibility for role play. Um, there are other scenarios in medicine where people do role play. If um, I present the symptoms of type 2 diabetes, for example, the best way a doctor finds out whether or not I'm at risk is to interview me. And the first thing most patients do when asked the questions that might lead to a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes is they lie because the questions are about my behavior. What's my diet like? I mm -hmm. only eat fruits and vegetables. No, I go to McDonald's every day, actually. You know, do I stay up too late? No, I go to bed at 9 o'clock every night. No, no, I'm out all night. You know, those things people have a tendency to lie about, and doctors, part of the medical procedure is to know the difference. So we use avatars to role play those kinds of things. Um, in the corporate world, we do, we do two types, well, we do several, but, but the big areas where we do work are in leadership and, um, uh, and customer interactions. So in leadership, we work with big companies, um, all of the big tech companies in Silicon Valley, or many of them, uh, companies like Amazon and McKinsey, big consulting firms. And we teach people how to have difficult conversations at work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how to give feedback to a colleague who is chronically tardy or rude to their coworkers or whose work product is uh, unprofessional. Um, feedback that makes them want to stay, not the feedback that makes them want to quit, right? So those conversations are hard to have and, and people sometimes react negatively to those conversations and so they can be very stressful. Um, similarly, we work with uh, businesses that have uh, uh, big requirements around customer service, hotels, restaurants, you know, national coffee chains that you can imagine have customers who come in and are angry mm -hmm. that their latte isn't the right temperature um, or they didn't get the, you know, the right amount of foam in their cappuccino. Those people have tough conversations and, and they have to know how to de-escalate conflict. And it's hard. Anybody who's been in a marriage or a relationship knows that de-escalating conflict is a very hard skill to get right. Mm -hmm. And so we train people how to do that by letting them rehearse those conversations over and over again so that when they experience the stress that makes them do the wrong thing, they've practiced it so many times that they can handle it calmly. What you have said uh, sounds as if you would uh, remove uh, behavioral psychologists. Uh, no, to the contrary, we are giving behavioral psychologists a platform to do therapy, actually. We, we use applied behavioral psychology all the time in our work. And, and, the, and the distinction is an important one. We're not training people to do the same thing for every human. If, if you and I have a very difficult conversation, you're going to behave differently than Olga will, for example. Mm -hmm. My job is to be able to read your body language, listen to your tone of voice, stop talking so I let you talk, and, and make sure that I am understanding you so that when we disagree, we learn how to disagree respectfully. The way I do that with you would be very different, should be very different than the way I do it with someone else because you're different. And um, so we are not driving simple tricks to try to get people to do the same thing every way. We're trying to get them to slow down, to listen, to not react emotionally, and to have tools for conversation. It's very funny, um, tech companies 
are very interested in this, and it is ironic that in an, one of the biggest problems they think that has led to the breakdown in people being able to have these conversations is technology itself. We spend so much time looking at our phone and our screen that we've forgotten how to look at one another. And we've forgotten how to read one another and many people would say we've lost the art of listening. So, uh, we work with University 2035 and uh, it's a new online university that um, helps students with their individual educational uh, tra trajectories. So, how could your technologies, how could your techniques be used and be incorporated into this model? So, one of the great advantages of VR is um, it is the ultimate platform for performance assessment. I think uh, the future of assessment, as the session this morning described, is not about children doing multiple choice tests. It's about children having the opportunity to demonstrate multiple ways to solve a problem. And going into VR is a way to demonstrate uh, a child's ability to do any type of collaborative work with other children. It is a way to demonstrate um, their ability to problem solve. It is a way for them to demonstrate their ability to work in a team and, conver and to do so in a way that is unique and still gets the right answer in their approach. Mm -hmm. um, for teachers, VR has enormous relevance to the future of personalized learning as you are envisioning it here for 2035. Um, for teachers, so much of the success in a personalized learning environment is being able to differentiate the way they teach content to approach learners who have different learning needs and different learning styles. And that is even more challenging in an online modality because you have to be able to read the needs of the learner by looking at their face and listening to them without the benefit of physical presence. So we can create virtual experiences for people to practice and rehearse those skills and assess how they do when they in confront children that have very special learning needs that they're working with in this modality. Um, teaching, people forget that the skills associated with teaching are teachable themselves. There is this view that teachers are somehow born as great teachers and other people are born as terrible teachers. And that could not be further from the truth. Teaching is a skill much like any other skill, of medicine, the law, what have you. It is, it is carefully modeled by experts. It is tried by novices and rehearsed with instantaneous feedback over and over and over again. Um, somebody, a famous American educator, once said, when talking about the number of decisions that a teacher has to make every day in her classroom, that teaching is like being a surgeon in an emergency room right after an earthquake, when thousands of patients come in and need to be treated right away. And the joke he tells about this is that it's even harder than that because the surgeon can only work on one patient at a time. But the teacher has 28 patients out there who want to learn in front of them and expect that teacher to be available for them. And that is a very, very hard skill to develop. And it takes practice and repetition. And VR is a way for people to get lots of opportunity to practice on avatar children so that they can do it well on real children.